First Columbia. Up in Brookhaven in Stony Brook, and then joined us almost 1998. 1998, so a good long time ago. Thank so, you, Oscar. Thank you, all graduate students, for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> I titled this Light to Life because uh, that's the title of my book that I'm working on, but it's uh, also something I've been thinking about for 30 something years. So let's think about this from the beginning. <clears throat> um, Virtually all electrons in life today are moved by reactions with solar energy. And <clears throat> this is what sunshine looks like at the top of the atmosphere. For those of you who think this is noise, those lines, that's not noise. Those are Fraunhofer lines. So those are lines that are attributed to elements within the solar corona that are absorbing photons before it leaves the sun. And so there you get a spectrum. Now, on Earth today, uh, we have ozone. So these photons over here in the ultraviolet, very few of them actually reach the surface of the planet. They're absorbed by ozone. But prior to about 2.45 years ago, uh, billion years ago, 2.4 billion years ago, there was no ozone. So those photons reached the planetary surface. Now, those are high energy photons. This is a distribution in wavelength, but it really is a distribution in energy. So this is high energy, and that's infrared radiation. That's low energy. You can see from roughly from here to roughly about there. That's your, your eyeball. So that's visible light. Now, if we take those high energy photons and we put them in play on minerals, which we don't normally do in geology. We don't think of light as a driver of chemical reactions in minerals, but it does. And these were done many years ago by a guy named uh, Alexander Cavalier-Smith at University of Glasgow, and then later by Martin Schoonen at, at Stony Brook University, who doesn't work at Stony Brook University anymore, works at Brookhaven National Lab. But I've been inspired by, uh, by some of those papers, especially by Karen Smith. And this is siderite, so that's iron carbonate. So iron carbonate is FeCO3, very simple. Just like calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate, it's just iron carbonate. Now iron carbonate is iron two, valence state of two. Now when you have an absorption of UV light, in this case it's about 270 nanometers, it can populate what's called an anti-bonding orbital, pop an electron off of the iron two generating iron three. So you can photo-oxidize siderite to make iron-3. That's the red target there, okay? That's that rust. We've rusted this with light. There's no oxygen in that chamber. Now, when you do that, you can make new minerals. So this is siderite, and this is its decomposition product after it's been long exposed to UV light, and that ultimately will become hematite and manganite. Why do I go there? Because if you're a chemist, then you follow the electron. What happened to the electron after it left the iron? The electron moved onto protons and became hydrogen gas. So this is a mechanism of generating hydrogen gas abiologically without heat just on the surface of the planet, just by solar energy. And why do I care about hydrogen? Because ultimately that's what photosynthesis does in life. It is moving electrons off of a substrate to generate hydrogen for reducing carbon to a sugar, for example. But these reactions are not catalytic. This is the amount of hydrogen that is generated. It's similar to, in the Archean Ocean, it would have been similar to that of all the subaerial volcanoes. And I have a graduate student in the geology department, Winnie Liu, who works on these kinds of reactions. She's been working, for example, with 
rhodochrosite, which is magnesium carbonate, I mean man manganese carbonate. <clears throat> and she can generate another product, which is called manganite, which is just mag magnesium oxidized, magnesium. So going from magne magnesium two to magnesium four generates hydrogen gas. And in this particular case, it also generates formic acid. So you can make a little bit of formic acid, which is itself oxidized by the manganese later. That's what's happening to it. It's a transient production. Now, I'm going to go on, just the geologists know this backwards and forwards, but I, I think it's an interesting situation for us because this is the, the Goldschmidt plot, of course. Victor Goldschmidt spent his life working on this. And so you have two elements up here, hydrogen and helium, which are generated from the Big Bang. So they're about 14 billion years old. And then all of this other stuff is generated in supernovae, not our star, but a very hot, short-life star that exploded before our solar system was formed. And these elements became captured by our sun and ultimately by the planetismals and ultimately, for example, Earth. And we know many of these records from meteorites as well as the solar spectrum of our star and other stars. And so there are two elements out here, uranium and thorium, which recently have been attributed not just to a supernova, but to neutron stars that are generating these types of elements as well. And potassium-40. So we have uranium and thorium and potassium-40 in the Earth's interior, which is generating heat. That's a source of energy from nuclear fission. And these two elements up here, especially hydrogen, <coughs> will generate energy and heat by fusion. So it's kind of ironic to me that at both ends of this elemental spectrum you have sources of energy. One is coming to the surface of the planet from a star, the other is within the planet as heat. So let's think about this for a second. Somewhere along the line, biology learned to capture that energy, the solar energy, to create chemical bonds. Catalytically, that means it didn't use up a substrate and just didn't make a simple product and that was the end of it, like the siderite reaction or the manganite reaction. <clears throat> so what is the game? The game is to move electrons, oxidation reduction, and it's doing it with four, I mean five really, of the big six elements. So these are the big six elements, right? The, the schnapps, C-H-N-O-P-S, the schnapp elements. So those elements, H, C, N, O, and S, undergo oxidation re and reduction reactions. So let's remember what they are. So an oxidation reaction is the removal of an electron with or without a proton. It's not, it can be the, re the removal of a hydrogen atom or the addition of oxygen. Reduction is just the opposite. It's the addition of an electron, the addition of a hydrogen atom, or the removal of, of uh, did I say that? Removal of oxygen? That's true. All right. So they're chemically equivalent. So let's just take a look at this. Why do we care about these big six? In all life that we know, the macromolecules are proteins, the carbohydrates, the fats and lipids, the, the nucleic acids, they're all composed of those six elements. So protein has nitrogen, very little phosphorus. Nucleic acids have lots of phosphorus, very little uh, of sulfur, and so on. So the sulfur is primarily found in proteins, but these are the big six. Now, the exception is phosphorus itself. Phosphorus is found in the form of phosphate, normally. At the fugacity of Earth, that's the amount of pr pressure of oxygen on Earth, phosphorus undergoes acid-base reactions. It's just transferring protons around. It's not transferring electrons. So the addition and subtraction of protons is acid-base chemistry. The addition and subtraction of electrons is oxidation reduction chemistry. Now, life is literally electric. This is not a metaphor. So we're sitting in this room, all of us, and we're breathing. 
So you're taking oxygen from the atmosphere in the room, and you're breathing out two gases. One is carbon dioxide, obviously. But the other is water. We often forget that we breathe out water. So the water is a result of the reduction of molecular oxygen to water. You have just added hydrogen atoms, in effect, to the oxygen to make the water. It doesn't hurt, right? You're not, you're not, you, you have an electrical field, but it, it, it's it within you, it doesn't hurt. So if you think about that, all organisms derive energy for growth using electrons. And therefore, the substrates and products that are produced, for example, in the case of us, the substrate being oxygen and sugars, and the products being carbon dioxide and water, have to be recycled. And any planet that has life, ultimately, that must be true. So all biological processes are paired. That doesn't mean that they're just the reverse of each other. We're not doing the reverse of photosynthesis in our bodies. <clears throat> but, for example, photosynthesis and respiration are paired. Now, in the Archean world, so let's go back some, I know many of you didn't take geology, but um, if I start here at the beginning of Earth's history at about 4.5 billion years, and I walk up to where Bob is sitting, roughly this is the Hadean. We have very little rock volume here. There's heavy impacts. We've got a moon. We've got oceans. And then I walk up from here, that's about 4 billion years, to roughly here, 2.5 billion. This is called the Archean. This is a very old period of Earth's history. No animals, no plants. Everything that evolves here is microbial in the ocean or in an aquatic system. And I walk over to approximately where Oscar is, and that's the Proterozoic. And we still don't have any animals or plants. And then from about here, we get our first animal. This is about 6.35 million, million years ago. And then we get up to here. And here is where Earth's history for us is about this big, that thick, OK? About the th thickness of a sheet of paper. So human beings, Homo sapiens as a species, is about 200,000 years old. So in the beginning, in the Archean, the source of electrons was H2 gas itself, which I showed you could be generated several ways, by volcanism or by photon energy uh, uh, interacting with minerals, by iron II itself, which was very abundant in the Archean Ocean, hydrogen sulfide, which is coming from heat sources within the Earth's surface, uh, within the Earth, and from carbohydrates. Now, where do I get these organics? Where do we get organics if you don't have early life? Meteorites. Meteorites. Chock a block full of amino acids and even partial nucleic acids. Chock a block. So we've identified so far there are 20 amino acids we use in life. There are 80 amino acids in chondritic meteorites, only eight of which are found in life. So we're missing several major amino acids that are not found, just simply made by uh, inorganic reactions in space. <clears throat> now, let's just take a look at this simple equation. So this is what every fifth grader learns, right? That water and carbon dioxide make a sugar and oxygen. That's the waste product of a plant, of a, an oxygenic photosynthetic organism. And then you and I are these guys. This is sugar. And we're eating the sugar. We're con combusting it with oxygen, literally. And we're producing these two products. Now, if that were balanced globally over geologic time, we wouldn't have any oxygen on the planet. So we had to hide this stuff from, from us and from other, other organism that respires. It's hidden in rocks. Rocks become the lockbox of sugars. Without that lockbox, we wouldn't have significant amounts of oxygen on Earth. Now, today, the major source of electrons is that molecule here. Now, if I took, this is a, a glass of water. It was just here on the, in the, on the speaker's bench when I came in. If I shine a light on it, nothing happens. It just gets hot. If you're flying over the ocean, you don't see bubbles of oxygen coming out of the ocean just like that. 
If the ocean was sterile, nothing would happen. So to use that, you had to make catalysts. And biology invented catalysts. And I, let me just show you, this is a funny little thing because I don't think we think about it this, this way. So this is the classic Apollo vision of Earth. And yes, yes, it's 71% of the surface is water. Got it. And I think on Wednesday we'll hear more about this from our speaker in geology. But if I took all that water and I put it into a ball, one volume, that's it. That's it. It's a very, very, very small amount of the Earth's volume. And you can do this theoretically with all of your classes. You can take a meter read of rule and say, okay, the Earth is a proportional diameter to this meter. How thick is the ocean? It's about equal to two sheets of paper. So it is amazing that we've had liquid water on the surface of this planet virtually as far back in time as we can go, and yet it hasn't gone anywhere. Whereas on Mars, it's no longer there. Liquid water is no longer on the surface of the planet. Liquid water is no longer on the surface of Venus, if it ever was. We're the only planet in the solar system that has liquid water on its surface today. There's ice, obviously, on Europa. There's ice on Mars. But um, we've had liquid water forever. Now, I'm talking about the nanomachines. I'm going to introduce now to the first concepts in biology, and this is going to be a cartoon. So this is the Rube Goldberg apparatus that is responsible for splitting water in every single photosynthetic organism. It contains four major machines. This machine here is the water splitting machine. It's called Photosystem II. It has two very, very highly conserved proteins, D1, so-called D1 and D2, diffuse band 1, diffuse band 2, and this water oxidation complex, which I'll show you in a second. It has another machine here, which transfers the electrons from here to it moves the electrons from here to there to there. And this machine is the cytochrome B6F complex in plants. And in us, we have a very, very, very similar complex in our mitochondria, which is allowing us to breathe oxygen. It's called the cytochrome BC complex. And then you have photosystem one. So if this is the first hits, four hits of, of excitons, four of absorbed quanta to generate 1O2. And then the electron is passed here. Why? This is a second reaction center. It looks structurally like this reaction center, but in sequence space, and it only has 8% sequence homology to that structure. It probably evolved independently, although we're not sure. In any event, we're pushing these electrons to a much more electron negative place, a place where it doesn't want to be. So imagine now that an electron is like, let's say in Japan, in Shinjuku at rush hour. So this is one of the busiest train stations in the world. At rush hour, if you're an electron, you don't really want to get onto the train. But some guy with white gloves comes and pushes you into the train, okay? Squeezes you in. Now you're in a very electron-rich world. A lot of negative charge here. Okay? The guy with the little white gloves is photons. It's pushing the electron to another electron-negative place. And those electrons then will combine to form the hydrogen carrier of life, or a hydrogen carrier of life, NADPH. That's a hydrogen carrier. We never get free hydrogen this way. Now, Jen Ren Shen, a Chinese biologist, at, um, structural biologist at Okayama University in Japan, has been in Japan since 1985, is a good friend. He's been working for many years on the structure, the actual structure of Photosystem II. That's the water splitting guy. And this is what it looks like. It's actually a very interesting Rube Goldberg of Rube Goldbergs because it's a dimer. So it's two exact sides. This is the, the line. So it's duplicated. That D1, D2, D1, D2 is here and there. And the actual water splitting complex is this mineral. So it contains four manganeses, one, two, three, four, one calcium, and several so-called oxo bridges. 
This so-called Cuban cluster, there are 31 minerals in nature that contain four manganese and one calcium. None of them look like that. So mystery number one, this is what is splitting the water. Mystery number two, how does it work? Where did it come from? It's a singleton. That means it's only found once in nature. Once. It doesn't occur anywhere else. So we don't know where this came from. We don't know what its evolutionary precursor was. So this is like a Darwin eyeball in molecular biology and structural biology land. And Haggai and others in the room, and we're familiar with this problem and have been thinking about this for a long time. Now, in order to capture the light, there are many molecules around here that are chlorophyll molecules. And they absorb light and make the cross-section for light, which seems to be very bright, but it's actually a pretty dilute energy source. It makes it much, much easier to capture the light. So instead of turning over an electron once every five seconds or once every 10 seconds, now you can turn over 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 or 100 in a second. That's the role of the antenna, to collect, collect the light and funnel it into the reaction center. And the reaction center is where this sucker is. Now, this is an absorption cross-section, absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A, and it's kindly made out for you in the real colors, or more, more or less the real colors. So this is violet, it absorbs a little bit in the violet, and then blue, and then little, very little absorption in green. And then there is an absorption in the red. <laughs> now, this is a funny molecule. The blue is called a Soray band, after a French chemist. Um, it, its only role is to capture the light. The light within femtoseconds, that's 10 to the minus 15 seconds, is transferred to this band here, which is where all the chemistry comes from. And that band has a very special property. That band is called the QY band. That band fluoresces. So this is chlorophyll. This is an acetone solution of chlorophyll. That's fluorescence. That's the QY band. So this is blue. It's absorbing the blue light and transferring within femtoseconds that energy to that QY band. OK? So that's fluorescence. And I'm going to lead you with that because I'm going to talk a lot about fluorescence in a few seconds. Now, we can take advantage of some structures of the chlorophyll molecule like this. The ocean is blue. And I'm not going to go into why the ocean is blue here. The ocean is not blue because of Rayleigh scattering. The ocean is blue because of what's called fluctuation density scattering. This is discovered in 1908 by Shmulakovsky. And then in 1910, rediscovered, in a sense, by Einstein. Both papers are in German, but both are translated into English, if you wish to, to see. Shmulakovsky was a very special person, by the way. He wrote only in German, but he was really brilliant. Doesn't get any credit because Einstein really was so dominant. But here is, let's take a look at this. Now, if I have, if I have light that is coming from the sun, goes into the ocean, the ocean is now blue, it wouldn't would be blue if any clear liquid was there. If you had an ocean full of ethanol, it would be blue. So the blue light is coming in, and some of it's going to be absorbed by the Soray band. Right? And it'll be absorbed both going in and backscattered out. So if I have a lot of chlorophyll in the ocean, there's less blue light leaving the ocean surface to space. So the ocean is going to be darker. And that's exactly the mecha mechanism by which we examine chlorophyll concentration from space using a ratio of the green absorption band to the blue, absor to the blue absorption band of a satellite. And we have satellites in space that are about as big as school buses now. We don't launch these anymore. <clears throat> but these were launched in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, actually, these were launched in the uh, mid-1990s. 
their modus AM and PM. AM has an equator crossing time of roughly 10 in the morning locally, and PM has an um, inverse orbit with an equator crossing time at 2 in the afternoon. And they have sweeps of arrays looking at spectral distributions of light. And what we have done over many years at NASA, many people have worked on this because you have atmospheric corrections and yada, 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 is to take the green band and the blue band, and you can generalize and make a map of the chlorophyll concentration from space, just from the absorption. So that's how it's done. And you can see that product every single day on ocean color maps uh, that are distributed by NASA <coughs> from the Goddard Space Flight Center. <coughs> now, for many years I've worked on what is the photosynthetic rate of the planet, of the oceans for sure. How, much, how many electrons does the planet generate photosynthetically? And we can measure this efficiency and I'm going to show you how we do this. So this is a rate constant for photochemistry. So I'll show you what that means in a minute. And I just showed you fluorescence. So that's the amount of light that is absorbed that is coming out to you as fluorescence, the fluorescence yield. And then some of that light that's absorbed is just moving molecules around. All it's doing is vibrating. So that's heat. That's useless. But it's an inevitable process. So you operate at roughly 35% efficiency, 25 to 35% efficiency, depending on your age and your metabolism. What does that mean? 25% of the energy when you're a kid is converted to something that is making a molecule. 75% is converted to heat. So let's just think for a second about how we do this. So we're going to measure Two of those three, if I, if I measure any one of the, so this is going to be the number over here is one. That's 100%. It has to account for these three processes. Some percent of this, some percent of that. That's photochemistry, fluorescence, and heat. So that's oxygen production, just moving mole uh, molecules around to go to the QY band and goes out into space, and then <coughs> heat. So we can measure two of those three easily by counting photons. And any time I get a process where I can look at something that is converted to light, we have incredible sensitivity. Because we can do single photons. We can measure single photons. If I convert it to sound energy, or I have some process that's converted to sound, ooh, not as easy. We can do it, but not as sensitive. In the ocean, we're talking about chlorophyll concentrations that are a thousand-fold less than what's in that scintillation vial, at least. So let's just talk about this process where we measure so-called FV over FM. And here's the way it works. Let me see. There's a piece of chalk here. So let's imagine a donor and an acceptor. Doesn't matter what the molecule is. I'm going to pop an electron off of the donor with light. So this is going to be donor plus. The acceptor now will be acceptor minus. OK? Can I measure that process by light? Yes. So here, we're measuring fluorescence of a living cell. The initial condition is this, donor is reduced, acceptor is oxidized or neutral, so both are neutral in the dark. That's the initial condition called FO. We add light, very, very, very bright light, very rapidly. So within 100 microseconds, all the donors become oxidized and all the acceptors become reduced. The fluorescence now rises, and I'll show you the equations for this in a second, to a maximum value. So this is QA minus, this is QA zero. So that's the quinone acceptor one, quinone acceptor two. I'm going to go very briefly th through this. And so Max Gorbanov, who's been with me for many years, is a very talented physicist and, and instrument builder. He makes these instruments in my lab. For, with, with, it just makes a great array of them. I don't want to go through the, all the, the physics of it, but I want you to understand there is some real physics here. 
So in FO, we have three possibilities. We have the rate constant for photochemistry, the rate constant for fluorescence, the rate constant for um, <coughs> thermal dissipation. So that's FO. At FM, we can't move another electron. It's already there. So KP goes to zero. So FV is the difference simply between these two. It is KP. It's the rate constant for photochemistry. And if I divide it by FO, it's the quantum yield of photochemistry. That's the percent. That's the number that I'm looking for for the KP in the original equation. So if I know that number, let's say it's 0.6, that means 60% of the absorbed light, 60% went to move an electron in photosystem 2. OK? All right. Now we can take the instruments. This is what made us famous many years ago. And we can drag them across the ocean. So we can go from Portsmouth to the Falkland Islands, for example, thousands of kilometers. And here's FE over FM. And many other parameters. It's a very, very, very sensitive measurement without any concentration of anything. You don't have to do any filtering, nothing. Instantaneously, you get these numbers. You know the photochemistry of Photosystem II across the world's ocean. Now, we have, with the same satellites that are flying around in those school buses, Mark Abbott, who's now the director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, many years ago wrote what's called the Algorithm Theoretical Basis Document. That's a mouthful. And here he realized that the sun is shining down in the ocean. It's also causing fluorescence. So some of the chlorophyll in the cell will fluoresce. Now, this goes back to a lot of old work. So if we take the sky, the sky has a backscatter function in the blue that's exactly lambda wavelength to the minus 4.000 power. That was calculated by Rayleigh. The backscatter function of the ocean is a little bit stronger. It's lambda to the minus 4.3, empirically measured, most famously by Andre Moreau. So there are excess photons, then, that should come out. And we can see them like this. If I take this background here, let's say, and there is fluorescence, there should be a little bit of light that's coming out that's above the background, because it's induced by solar light. And that can be projected from point A here, which is intercept 1, intercept 2. This is now what we call the fluorescence line height. The fluorescence line height is simply proportional to the amount of chlorophyll that is fluorescing in the upper ocean. And when I say upper ocean, I mean the upper ocean. It's the first few centimeters. Now, we get this product every day. And if I divide the fluorescence line height by the chlorophyll concentration, It's equal to the quantum yield of fluorescence. What does that mean? It means the amount of fluorescence per molecule of chlorophyll. That's a quantum yield. So Mike Berenfeld, who was a postdoc with me for several years and is now at Oregon State University, runs the MODIS fluorescence instrument. Uh, and he has now the control of distributing the product every month, which he's tasked to do by contract. This is not a grant. Um, oops. So um, we get these, these products every day for every month of every year. The problem is, how can you tell whether it's giving you garbage or is it real? And 
I was thinking about this for several years, and Max and I were down at the Goddard Space Flight Center, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe? More than 10. And I asked Max to build a fluorescence lifetime instrument, which had never been done in the ocean. So I'll explain to you this in a second, how this works and why. Because that is the only mechanism for which you can ground truth what the MODIS satellite sees. Now, the theory of the fluorescence lifetime. Remember now we had those two absorption bands. The Soray band and what's called the QY band. So this is the red band. If I put this in energy space, this is going from high energy to low energy in the wave number domain, not in the wavelength domain, because the wave number domain is directly proportional to energy. This is a distribution of excited states. That's electrons that are populating higher excited states within the orbital of the molecule. Now there's a product which is well known in physics, which is you can't measure this. You have to do it theoretically. So there's a distribution of these electrons. And if they were all to collapse to the ground state, and that was the only mechanism by which they would collapse to the ground state, what would be their lifetime? This is called the natural lifetime. So this, can, as I say, cannot be measured. It has to be calculated. And that natural lifetime, called Tn, is equal to 15 nanoseconds. This was calculated by Steve Brody and uh, Rabinovich, actually, uh, in 1953 for Steve's. Steve is no longer uh, alive. But when Steve was alive, I mean, he was very famous for this calculation. <clears throat> so that's or T0, that's the natural lifetime. So if I measure the lifetime and I divide it by the natural lifetime, that is the quantum yield of fluorescence. And so can we measure that? Yes. So Max was clever enough, I mean really clever, to make an instrument that can measure in the picosecond time domain the variations in the lifetime of fluorescence as we traverse the oceans, just like we did with the variable fluorescence instrument. But this is a different instrument. This is just measuring fluorescence lifetimes to get the quantum yield of fluorescence, the second. And so we have this sensitivity that is amazing. Now, I'm just very quickly going to go through the physics of this. Um, we have this antenna, which is like a dish. And you can imagine the center of the dish antenna is the reaction center. So we're funneling all the excitation to there. Now, the cross-section, the physical cross-section or the absorption cross-section of this disk is proportional to a one-hit Poisson distribution. That means that the cross-section is equal to, this could be for oxygen over oxygen maximum. It doesn't matter. It's this number from 0 to 1. And it, this is going to be the intensity of flashes like this. That's the way it'll go. So that cross-section is 1 minus e to the minus sigma i, where i is quanta per angstrom squared. And sigma, therefore, must be angstrom squared per quanta. So it's wavelength dependent. Now, we can measure lifetimes, and we can measure the cross-sections. And you can imagine that if you have a situation where you have an uncoupling of the reaction center from the antenna, that we dissipate more of the energy by fluorescence. And that's true. So the reaction center doesn't get as much energy. And this is really, really, really common in the ocean. It's not common on land plants. So this is really common, for example, in iron limitation. This is the phenomenon. You make the antenna, the reaction center doesn't use it. You use the energy, the absorbed light. I can go on, but the point is this. We can drag these instruments around the world. This is lifetime instruments. And you can see the fluorescence lifetimes. Now, when the fluorescence lifetimes are low, it means it's a much more efficient machine. When the fluorescence lifetimes are high, you're dissipating a lot more energy than you need. And that's not good. So <clears throat> this is the fluorescence yield over here. If you're down <clears throat> here, you're good. You're up here, not so good.
And we can map that and we can do that and compare it to what satellites see and that's what we did in science a few years ago with Han Lin. And it turns out that the average lifetimes are on the order of about one nanosecond. So one divided by 15, that's the natural lifetime, one divided by 15 is about 7%, right? So, the average quantum efficiencies for photochemistry based on the variable fluorescence, FV over FM, for the ocean is 0.35, 35%. It's not 60%, it's only 35%. So I have one is 0.35 plus 0 0.07 minus one minus this is equal to the thermal heat. approximately 60% of the absorbed photons in the ocean are just going to be burned up as heat. Amazing. The ocean is really inefficient. On land, it's just the opposite. 65% is photochemistry. About 3% is fluorescence. So this would be 65 plus about 0 0.03 that's 68, 70, which means only about 30% of the energy is dissipated as heat in the leaf. And <clears throat> I'm not going to go into all of this. You can, you've seen these maps many, many times. Um, we don't have to land on Earth to realize that the Earth is alive because you have a seasonal variation in the amount of green on land and in the ocean. But if we take all these maps and Chris Field and his graduate postdoc at the time, Jim Randerson, and myself and Mike Berenfeld, who was a postdoc with me then, put together a compilation of all the terrestrial and all the marine productivity on the planet and we came up with this very relatively famous graph or figure which calculated that marine productivity, which has only got about 0.2% of the total carbon biomass in the photosynthetic biomass in the world is approximately responsible for 48, 49%, or I mean 46% of the, of the total primary production in petagrams. This is in petagrams. And it has a turnover time of about five days. Every cell in the ocean, on average, every photosynthetic cell in the ocean has to replicate itself or it will be eaten within five days. On land, you have 600 petagrams of carbon. It's about 99.8%. Most of it is obviously wood. So maybe I'm being a little unfair, but that's the way it is. I count it as live. It has a net productivity of around 54%, 56.4 petagrams. Conveniently adding up, most of this adds up to about 100 and something. And it has a turnover time of about, about a decade. Now, how am I doing? I still have 10 minutes. So let me just quickly go on. In the ocean, of course, we have a biological pump today, and that means that some of the productivity in the surface waters will be going to depth, and some of it actually will go into the sea floor and become incorporated into sediments. And actually, that's not a very big number. Um, we don't know the number exactly, but it's on the order of maybe 0.1%. I don't know, Liz maybe have a more up-to-date number, but I think that was Hedge's number on that order. And where is it found? Well, in today's world, it's found in shallow seas and along continental margins. By the time it goes to two, 3,000 meters, most of that carbon is burned up. It doesn't make, get incorporated into the sediments. The sediments in the middle of the ocean primarily are oxidized. They're not filled with organic matter. So this is really the reservoir of that organic matter today. And over geologic time, when we have active margins, those, some of this material will be uplifted onto the cratons and taken out of the Wilson cycle. And that's how we can accumulate lots of oxygen over geologic time. Now, I'm going to shift gears here because I want to show you the power of variable fluorescence and its proof 
of the photosynthetic rates being uh, really, really, really controlled by nutrients, which is not the case on land. Most of the photosynthetic processes on land are controlled by light or water. So if you look at a map of the distribution of, of photosynthetic biomass on land, it's virtually a map of rainfall and then season. So light and water. So many years ago, Joe Reed at Scripps noted that there were several regions of the world where even in the summer, there was excess phosphate. And so there are three regions that were identified ultimately, the subarctic Pacific right here, the eastern equatorial Pacific here, and the southern ocean in general. Several years later, I remember exactly when this first came out, it was in 1988, and I was in Annapolis, and I was with uh, several of my colleagues at a meeting, and this paper appeared in Nature by late John Martin, saying that iron was a limiting nutrient and everybody else had measured it wrong. That the actual concentrations of iron in the ocean were an order to two orders of magnitude lower than everybody else had ever measured it. And <clears throat> this is from Rob, these data. And here's Rob's very, very, very nice measurements of iron in the eastern, in the, actually in the mid-Pacific gyre, North Pacific gyre, I think these data were from. And you're talking here, I, I don't, should have made that a little clearer. This is one nanomolar up there. So this is, I think, about 150 or so picomolar. And John Martin, of course, had the very famous quote, you know, give me a tanker full of, of, of iron and I'll give you an ice age. So where does iron come from? Well, there are two sources, riverine flow and aeolian iron. This is another very famous photograph. So this is iron that is blown off of the sub-Saharan desert, the Sahel. These are the Canary Islands over here. And so you can see this is iron in the atmosphere. This is called aeolian iron. Aeolian meaning wind-blown iron from the Greek gods of wind. Now, this was observed many, many, many years ago, actually, by Darwin. Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle, he said, the sky around the Canary Islands is yellow. And I've been there, I've worked there, it is amazing, it is yellow. Now, Yuan Gao, who is at um, <coughs> Rutgers in Newark, noted that the distribution of continents is asymmetrical, obviously, so there's much, much more iron in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. The fluxes of iron are much higher in the northern hemisphere than they are in the southern hemisphere. Now, I'm going to try to do this another way because I have to end the show here. One second, because this movie won't play otherwise. OK. So this is a very sophisticated iron fertilization experiment. This is the Melville going out of Christchurch to the Antarctic. The typical pre-experiment gathering of the, the people that are going to do the work. And now we come to the mix master. We're taking iron sulfate, ferrous sulfate, Fe2. That's, that's the reagent bottle. It's going into the mixer. Max, you were on this cruise. There you go. So this is the very expensive deploying system. Costco, 50 bucks. It goes off the fan tail with a lead weight. And now you're pumping iron into the ocean. And then, of course, 
We're going to sample it. So I, I don't know, do I bore you with this? These are just Niskin bottles on the rosette. Um, so this is not the clean bottles. This is not, these are not the iron free bottles yet. For those of you who don't know, that's Richard Barber from Duke University, Professor Emeritus now. All right. And then Ken Johnson's going to say, lower this sucker, and we're going to fire the bottles as we come up. Okay, 40 meters, please, 40 zero. Okay, Ken, you're going to And this now is all plastic. This is an iron-free sampling system. And we're going to do the same thing. All right. Now, so we put the iron out like you're mowing a lawn, right? It's about an 8 by 8 kilometer system. You make a little square. You put a buoy in the middle so you can follow this as it moves along. And you have a tracer in there, which is um, <clears throat> sulfur hexafluoride, which is not made by any organism. So it's a total tracer that is totally made by human beings that can be traced by a gas chromatograph. And then we come back across. Okay? And you know exactly the time you went outside the patch. So those are the little diamonds here, and then we're going to go into the patch and come up in this patch and that through the patch again. And you, you know how far from the end to the beginning, so you know how old this system is. And we're just going to measure FV over FM in this case. So here's the photosynthetic energy conversion efficiency. Right before we measured, put the iron in, it's 25%, 0.25. That's the, Photochemical energy conversion efficiency of photosystem two. In this case, 24 hours later, we doubled it. There's no change in the chlorophyll concentration. We just changed the efficiency by which you could capture the absorbed photons and use them for photochemistry. We doubled it within 24 hours. And that's due primarily to the synthesis of one single protein that is limited by iron. It's cytochrome B559, for those of you who are interested. So I'm going to end this story. This is what we think the ocean looks like from a point of view of a phytoplankton. This is the light to life story. Most of the time, and this has always been true, had to have always been true, phytoplankton in the real world ocean are inefficient in converting absorbed solar energy to photochemical energy. They're inefficient. The limitation is imposed by two major nutrients, primarily nitrogen in the central gyres and in the three high nutrient low chlorophyll regions by iron. And we've done 13 iron addition experiments in the world's ocean, we, the collective community. We were on the very first one. Penny Chisholm kindly gave me a berth on that, and Zbysha Kolber went, and then it was thought that that was an artifact, so then we sent Berenfeld on the second cruise. Um, and we've been on several of them with the Germans, with and obviously the Iron X experiments in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, and then in the Sofix experiments, and so on. So the model I have is that phytoplankton basically are body surfing. They're waiting either for a pulse of nutrients from the sky, or from an eddy, or from a storm, and then they'll zip up very quickly from 0.25%, uh, 25 percent efficiency to 50 to 60, 65 percent efficiency for a few days. And then as the nutrients are depleted by them, their efficiencies go down and down and down, and they're waiting for the next wave, the body surfing wave. So the ocean is incredibly highly variable physiologically, depending on mesoscale turbulence or storms and or atmospheric events that are delivering a desired nutrient. So and they wait for a pulse to temporarily reach the maximum photosynthetic efficiency, and that's it. Then they go back and sort of way, lay in quiescence. So it's kind of like a person going to a party, gorging themselves, and then going home and starving for the next five days or six days. No meals. 
I want to give a shout out to Max for his great talent in building instruments and for working with me and the students and postdocs and others. Uh, and <clears throat> right now we're funded by NASA. And the idea here is, for example, we propose to NASA to build five pairs of those instruments, lifetime and flu variable fluorescence instruments, and deploy them on ships of opportunity. So for example, today, there is a pair of the instruments on the Bellingham, I mean on the Armstrong, um, at Woods Hole. So that's the flagship of the, of the Woods Hole fleet. It's contained and within uh, and operated by the technicians on the ship. So there's a continuous flow of data. We're going to be trying to put them on three more ships over time. So I want to say thank you very much. And uh, I, have, I think I have time for one or two questions. Yeah, yeah. Paul, I understand I run limitation in HNLC, but most of the ocean you would run for limitation in other major nutrients. Nitrogen primarily. So how would I run it? So nitrogen, they have two different effects. So we know the iron, we have never done an, an, uh, a nitrogen fertilization of the ocean. Never, okay? So we, I don't have data uh, of ocean addition of iron directly in, without taking samples and putting them in bottles, which I don't like to do. So we're stuck with what we got, and what we got right now is iron fertilization experiments to show you the, the effect. But what we do have is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of data around the world oceans of variable fluorescence and lifetimes. But is there a cost for those organisms to build these antennas and everything? Mm -hmm. you know, of course. So here's the, here's, here's, here's the cost-benefit analysis, a very simple one. They make most of the machines except that which they cannot make because they're limited by a nutrient. In the case, for example, of, of, uh, of nitrogen limitation, it's life harvesting pigment protein complexes primarily. In the case of iron, it's a, a cytochrome primarily. All right, so you make everything that you can. Now you get a pulse of the nutrient. Now you fire up the machinery to try to just make as much light harvesting pigment protein complex as you can quickly if it's nitrogen limitation or the cytochrome B559 complex uh, and insert the heme in there if it's iron limited. And now you can zap into this very quickly. And there's a second strategy which I didn't describe. In every single iron fertilization experiment, the number one organism that comes up, number one, is a diatom, diatoms, okay? And what's the advantage of a diatom? So diatoms are late evolving species. Their fossil record only goes back about 150 million years, which in terms of phytoplankton evolution makes them very late, actually. Diatoms have a very funny strategy. They're, they are, form a picket fence around all the continents. And inside of the cell, there is basically a food pantry called a vacuole. And this is why diatoms, which are blooming now, probably, down by the coast, they're blooming now, in February or early March. There's a lot of nitrate out there, a lot of phosphate, a lot of silicate. They're sucking up the nitrate and putting it into the food pantry. So you shut off the nutrients for them. You have a pulse of nutrients. They suck it up. They put it in the food pantry. And then they can go for three, four, five divisions without there being external nutrient anymore. No other major group of phyto, uh, eukaryotic phytoplankton has this uh, availability to this extent. So diatoms will win very quickly when there's a pulse of nutrient. And so that's the second strategy. Yeah. Debashish. Well, the one bioavailable nutrient that has never been shown, to my knowledge, in the open ocean to be limiting is phosphorus. And the reason is simple. There's a lot of organic phosphorus. And cells can make alkaline phosphatase, or an acid phosphatase, is a, it may be. But they can make phosphatases and cleave the phosphate groups off the organics and acquire it. So this goes back to a very, very long way to a discussion 
that I've had many, many times with the late Wally Broker, for example. Wally Broker indoctrinated, and that's not a strong enough word, actually, every single one of his graduate students to believe in phosphorus limitation in the ocean, and it came from a 1958 paper of uh, <clears throat> Redfield. In 1958, in the American Journal of Science, Redfield noted the following. Based on very few observations at the time, um, these were primarily Francis Richard's observations, that the N to P ratio by atom in plankton was roughly 16 to 1, right? That's the famous Redfield ratio. Now you go look in the world oceans in general. In the North Atlantic, the N to P ratio in the interior of nitrate to phosphate is equal to about 14.5 or 14.6 to 1. In the Indian Ocean, it's 13.9. Why? We denitrify the ocean in some places where there's lack of oxygen, such as the Indian Ocean, much more than you do in the North Atlantic, which is relatively well ventilated, and you can fix more because you have more iron in the North Atlantic. So, is phosphate or nitrogen, in any form, more limiting? This was the debate of the 1960s and 70s. So Epley, Dugdale, many, many, many chemical slash biological oceanographers went out to investigate that exact problem and came to the conclusion that nitrogen was much, much more limiting than phosphorus. There are other, there are other ways of dealing with this issue of the nitrocline versus the phosphocline and so on. But, so, this is not found in organics so easily. This is not easily acquired from organics. The concentration of organic nitrogen in soluble form in the ocean is nanomolar. You don't have something analogous to an acid phosphatase to cleave a nitrogen off an amino acid very easily. So <clears throat> this is bioavailable. This is not so bioavailable. Scarce. Okay. Any other questions? Malin. No seeds, right, no seeds, you know, they can have sex, but it doesn't matter really, that's just a gene transfer, you didn't make many organisms out of it. Um, it's really striking that that's, that's the strategy. Obviously on land, a very, very different strategy emerged for reproduction with higher plants, totally. The embryophytes really got that down. Well, you know, I could argue that there are, are seagrasses or, or uh, you know, multicellular algae that are, are similar to that. But they're only in coastal regions. Seaweeds. Seaweeds, exactly. Oh. Laminaria. <laughs> Laminaria is an example of that, right? Yeah. So Rob, Rob or Bob, I don't care. Bob. You only know me for 20 years. Um, the, uh, so, so iron fertilization, of course, is discussed as a geoengineering yeah. Mm -hmm. um, nitrogen fertilization, you, you tell them we're already doing a lot of nitrogen fertilization, presumably. Is it, well, why, why is one discussed in that context and not the other? Because the amount of nitrogen we're adding from aeolian nitrogen or from riverine nitrogen is trivial relative to the amount of nitrogen that is required to really disrupt or alter the global amount of carbon fixation. The iron fertilization experiments as a geoengineering uh, mechanism were first proposed not only um, by Martin, by Bill Martin, um, I mean John Martin, but by, um, by Adam Heller. So Adam Heller was an engineer. He thought this was a great idea. Many people went to uh, that meeting uh, in Texas um, and it was sponsored by the National Academy of Engineering uh, and the National Academy of Sciences at the time. And what came out of that were a, a group of people that started to model what would happen if we 
added iron to the Southern Ocean. And that's the only ocean that's viable to do this in. And those modelers included Jorge Sarmiento, and they included, uh, they included many people, uh, Caldera. And the conclusions were that, yes, you could take carbon out of the atmosphere for a time, if you did this continuously. Uh, you would sink it. The organic material would decompose, they felt, or not felt, they modeled, it was decomposed, causing hypoxia or anoxia, leading to the production of methane, nitrous oxide, and other gases that had much higher greenhouse absorptivity than CO2 itself. So um, it is actually now, we are not allowed by convention from the, the State Department and from the National Science Foundation to do any iron fertilization anywhere anymore. That's, that's the way it is. Um, but that's, it, it, it is, was thought to be a viable option. And I was surprised because last week, uh, Kia was here, and she is resurrecting iron as a mechanism for potentially producing ice ages again. This is kind of back to the future, you know? All right, up to you guys. Any, any other questions? So, I mean, back to the back of life guy eats a bunch and then hangs out in his house. Are we getting to a point where we could actually predict how many lives, how many divisions they can survive? Because right now, yeah. you can't constrain any coupled food web model yeah. in there. And can we, based on the first principle of physiology, actually start constraining those models? Yeah, I think we have enough data on the uh, R star value for organisms to give you the number of divisions and with the mortality rate. So the answer is, I think, yes. At least we can model it. Yeah, OK. That's Lexi's first paper, right? OK, thank you very much for listening.